Oh, greetings, everyone. How, how is everyone doing? Yes, I hope greetings. everyone's doing Greetings, nice. everyone. Good to have you back. On this lo lovely summer day. <laughs> you know, as we come out of that solstice period, Yeah, it's true. you know, so yeah, so new energy, new frequency. They say we've got a different sun in the sky, you know. They say it's not the same as the old sun, so there's new opportunities. You know, when they say nothing new under the sun, but if it's a new sun, maybe there's new opportunities now. So, <laughs> um, Yeah. but yeah, how how's everyone been doing? I hope everyone's been all right. I have Yeah, been I know. doing good. Thank you. Oh, Good good. evening to the two of you. Yes, good evening. Evening. Yes, so we're, we're going to go um, through, um, we called the presentation Frame of the Body. Um, the name, actually, the name came from, there, there was this um, rapper, very metaphysical, and he said this lyric, which, you know, just fell in love with, he said something like, um, I studied under the full moon, uh, the observing the frame of the body under the full moon and I created karate you know but we're, we're, we're not creating karate out here we're, we're creating a new form of tai chi <laughs> we're moving forward with that <laughs> um, Hmm. It was that cannabis. oh no no um, I think the artist liked cannabis but it was an artist called Kambata yeah, he's Okay. you know he, he's I don't think he's as popular as he should be. I mean, he's just di a different artist, you know. One of definitely one of my favorite, but yeah. Um, Well, and that's more metaphysical, isn't it? That description well, he, there. he well, he is a metaphys. He's into all the metaphysics and all that, and you know, he he even the way he thinks is very metaphysical, etc. Um, but yeah. Over the weekend, I, I was tested, you know, to use the frame of my body. So I, I took a hike to Snowdonia. Okay. And, you know, it really had to rely on that, the, the baseline strength, because I was unprepared. And, you know, on Snowdonia, there's like seven trails you can do. One, the easiest one is take the, the train up. to the top of the mountain. <laughs> Hmm. Well, one. the one that most people do is called the Pig's Trail, PYG Trail. I have a friend who's very hyperactive and, yeah, let's say he's overly energetic and overly, yeah, spontaneous. So he... Ran up the you ran up the mountain. I went up the mountain, but I went... I, I picked the hardest trail. Your your back your back, sir. Yeah, yeah, I'm back. Um, but yeah, there, there was a part where I was crawling on my um, bum and it was just inefficient. So I thought, okay. But, you know, it was, again, it was using the body and, you know, using the body in the most energy efficient way possible. And, you know, climbing up this hike and this mountain and the most difficult trail of this mountain, I think it's called... cog something but you know I'd done the research after I mean if I'd done the research before there's no way I'd be up that trail um yeah no no, no chance and yeah it's you under seeing actually how efficient the body has to be you know because I didn't feel the the tiredness or the exhaustion but it was only after that night where I was sweating a lot you know And, you know, my friend said, you know, this is very common uh, with, when people are exhausted from doing things like that. And, you know, the body picked the right time to be exhausted. It hadn't got the time to be exhausted, you know. So what I'm basically trying to say is that, you know, your body, whether it's a bit of adrenaline, your body will always try subconsciously to be as efficient 
as it can. And a lot of that efficiency as we're going to go into is to do with the structure of the body, you know, the frame of the body. And this is where we can get different body types, which are definitely better at different things. So when we're looking at like um, the people that do shot put in, you know, you can see that they're generally bigger guys compared to, you know, a smaller frame needed for jockeying a horse, you know. So, yeah, we're, we're going to go into a little bit of that. I'm going to start off with the, you know, some of that basic science and we're going to integrate it with, um, you know, the, the metaphysics of the body, just so we can get that complete understanding. Yeah. So without no delay. Yeah, you're okay. okay. Let's, let's get into it. Okay. Yeah. So, so when we're looking at the frame of the body or our posture or our structure, whatever we want to call it, um, the thing that always comes to mind is, you know, our skeletal structure. When we're looking at the skeleton itself, um, we can compare it to the scaffolds on a building. You know, anytime we're building, um, you know, any building or any structure that goes up, you always see people build up the skeletal structure or the scaffold or the, the outer layer. So my friend right now is building a house in, in the Gambia and, you know, he's got all the walls up, you know. Not only has he got the outside walls, but he's got the walls that will divide one room for, from another, you know. So we can see that, you know, the skeletal structure or that frame, it, it's a very, it's necessary because it, it allows um, for the attachment of other things to join onto the structure, you know. So even like, for example, if you're painting a picture, so a lot of people, if they're painting the face, a lot of people might, you know, they might do the outline of the head first. So once they've got the outline of the face, that's when they will add the things, you know, like the eyes, the mouth, the nose, etc. You know, you do get other artists that, might start with the eyes and work their way out. But whatever they do, there's always a reference point, you know, and this is the same um, with the skeleton. So, you know, even as um, therapists, you know, we measure things by a reference point on the body. So in order for me to find what we call your patella tendon, which is this part here, what I'm going to do first is reference it from where your patella bone is, which is also known as your kneecap. So when I've had a landmark on this point, your patella, I know underneath that is the patella tendon. So when we're looking at the skeletal structure, it's the frame, you know, and not only is it the frame, but it's also the reference point, you know, so... Even in Chinese medicine, if we're doing things like acupuncture, we would measure a point on the body and then use our measurement system, which is known as Kun, to identify where an acupuncture point is. So in all these examples, we can see how the skeletal structure is very important, yeah, as a reference point. Um, not only is it a reference point, but it also provides protection for our body. So, you know, enclosed in the rib cage is all our vital organs. So with our vital organs hidden behind the rib cage, you know, if we get a blow to the chest or something like that, then, you know, our ribs are going to take most of the impact first before, you know, our organs are at risk of injury. So it does provide, you know, that protection and when we also think of the way that the nerves and blood vessels, you know, run through our body, again, there's an element of protection, but there's also an element where, you know, if it allows um, things to, you know, 
holding a, a formation. So we know that, you know, when we're looking at the ankle bone, or let's just say the inner ankle, you know, which we call our medial malleolus, you know, there's structures that run along like tendons. And again, you know, there, there's an element of protection and there's also an element of organization um, that our bones um, allow within our body. Yeah. Um, also, what we can see here, especially when we're looking at the spine, with the spine, it also allows a, um, a pivot point, a place that we, we have a little bit of axle rotation. And this, this is good for movement, locomotion, getting from one place to another, and also changing and manipulating into different postures. You know, without that axle point, then, you know, we will become very stiff and almost robotic, and our movements wouldn't be as beautiful as they appear now. And we can see this problem with conditions like AS, ankylosing spondylosis, where, you know, the infl inflammation of um, the vertebra and the stiffness of the vertebra significantly reduces a person's range of motion. So, when we're looking at the skeletal system, it is made out of 206 bones. Um, and what's, what's interesting as well is when we're, you know, we can separate um, mammals or, you know, animals by invertebrates and uh, vertebrates. So vertebrates are things or, you know, organisms with a backbone you know, like human beings, like um, chimpanzees, and animals without a vertebra are called invertebrates, you know. And when we observe, you know, animals that have vertebrates, again, their movement pattern is often different from creatures that do not have any backbone. So when we're looking at the backbone, specifically, we can see that it has of 33 um, vertebrates individually stacked. When we're looking at the cervical, thoracic, and the lumbar, we can see that there's, you know, a distinct separation between each vertebrae. But when we get to the sacrum and the coccyx, what we can see, how these individual vertebrates have become fused as one. So, you know, with the sacrum, there's five fused um, vertebrates. And then with the coccyx, mostly there's fours. And I believe in some people there, there might be five, etc. Yeah. So again, these individually stacked areas, and they have the intervertebral discs, which again allow for that rotation, movement, and the disc offer. Um, an element of um, protection and shock absorption. So, you know, if we're doing something like jumping, instead of everything cracking or stressing under pressure, we got things where, you know, the vertebrates are squashing and the gel-like substance within the intervertebral disc can squash a little bit to allow movement and then re rebound. Okay. So, yeah, so, yeah, that's um, the, the skeletal um, system. And again, this is just, just keeping it simple, but making you more think about the structure because, you know, there's so many different aspects of our skeletal system. Another aspect of it is things like, you know, producing red blood cells and also being vital for our immunity. But we're just going to touch on the aspect, which is that postural side. So when we're looking at the uh, musculoskeletal system, um, we understand that there's about 600 um, muscles in our body. You know, some texts will say a little bit more. Um, I haven't seen much text say a little bit less. But, you know, there's some muscle that people is 
very visible in people and then you know there's the odd small muscles that are not very common in everyone yeah so when we're looking at um, the muscle we can see that we've got the skeletal muscles which are our voluntary muscles these are the muscles that we is under our conscious control at the same time there's part of that system which is part of under our subconscious control you know because a lot of the time nowadays we're very robotic you know we might move from one room to the next room without really thinking about it you know just drifting but for the most part we're not going to go into the technicalities when we're thinking of skeletal muscles they're under our conscious control when we're looking at um the involuntary muscles then they're not so much under our conscious control you know these are the muscles that are aid us in digestion for example these are the muscles that um that will help you know the mucosa within the lining of our body to you know help movement etc so these are things that are not directly under our control but at the same time there's still an element of control that we can uh, initiate over it you know but that's going you know looking at things like you know through meditation controlling ones um you know either digestion or controlling one's heart rate or you know all of these things that if we can do to affect the para a sympathetic nervous system which is basically the bit that helps us to relax you know then that's a window of our consciousness where we can control some of these involuntary muscles but for the most part of this presentation we're really just speaking about um our skeletal muscles yeah so we we'll further divide um the skeletal muscles or the voluntary muscles into kind of skipped here uh, so we're basically it's just the wrong heading actually so ignore that but breaking it down into phasic and tonic muscles so tonic muscles um you know they're like our postural muscles they're the ones and when we're thinking of postural muscles we're thinking of um things that help resist the effects of gravity and then we've got the phasic muscles which are is basically the bigger muscles like our biceps or the quadriceps which is really helping us move yeah so this is just a table just explaining about the two systems so i think there is uh, let's see so what I was thinking, it's not quite on this list here, um, or I can't see it at a glance, but when we're looking at postural muscles, our postural muscles are muscles, because they have to withstand the effects of gravity, their muscles are, are generally going to have to be able to contract over a much longer period of time. So they, they've got a basically higher rate of endurance, whereas, you know, the phasic muscles are generally a lot bigger. They're more for movement, but they're the ones that are going to fatigue a lot quicker. So if you can imagine if one's at a desk sitting down for a long period of time, we need our postural muscles to be able to, you know, last hours. Not to say we should be at the desk for that long, but let's just say if we had to go again walking or trekking, you know, we want to do that in an upright posture because in the upright posture that's going to help us be more energetically efficient you know if these postural muscles were not quite working over you know a longer period of time because uh, you know we need them to endure more if they're not quite doing that you know our posture is going to collapse and then everything's going to be a lot more energetically consuming and you know as a therapist, we can see this a lot with um, people who's got neurological conditions such as multiple sclerosis, etc. You know, sometimes they can fatigue 
a lot quicker, where a simple, what we might find as a 20 minute walk in a park, you know, they might find as a very laborious activity. And that laborious activity is going to, you know, cause other problems like fatigue, muscle aches, um, exhaustion, um, and also potential risk of injury. So we can see why we need our postural muscles to allow us to maintain a good posture. Um, and these are often the, you know, the deeper muscles like our multifidy muscles, you know, that go along our spine, you know, that is helping us maintain that uprightness for a long period of time. Whereas, um, again, a muscle like the quadriceps, you know, they're bigger, they're meant for locomotion, um, they're working with our postural muscles, but, you know, if we've done something like sprinting, you know, we had to go away, you know, get away very quickly. They're going to fatigue a lot quicker. Um, no muscle is truly, purely tonic or truly, purely um, phasic, um, because that really depends on how we train them as well. And that also depends on the mixture of faster and slow twitch muscles. So every muscle is on a continuum. Some muscles are more tonic, some muscles are more phasic, for example. And then how we train them is, you know, how we can make them better at doing what they're designed to do. Okay, so... All right, and yeah, these are just some of um, the examples and you see here, actually, it's interesting to use the word predominantly. Predominantly meaning it's not a hard and fast rule. It's not black and white, but it's just an example of, you know, how the muscles are more predisposed to each and, every, each and one of these um, categories. So if, for example, we look here, we can see that... Um, just looking for muscle that everyone will be familiar with. Um, so trichinemius, you know, and the soleus muscles, we can see that they're part of that postural muscles. Again, when we're standing, you know, and our ankles at a certain angle, which is what we call plantar grade, these muscles need to be efficiently efficient, say, if we're standing in a concert for a long period of time. Um, however, you know, let's say if we're, we need to walk and we're moving up a hill, we've got our gluteal muscles, which are very big, powerful muscles, which we see in sprinters or, you know, anyone that's doing, who are very active, power lifters, we see these muscles very big in, yeah, these muscles, you know, they're muscles that are going to help us get from A to B you know, and they're going to fatigue a lot quicker. And, you know, so the question might come in the head as, well, okay, I'm walking, but my glute muscles are working. Um, so should I need postural muscles? But, you know, these muscles are working together. And because they're working together, they allow movement in the correct posture over a long period of time. So you might feel, okay, but I've walked, you know, five hours up this mountain, then surely my glutes should be purely postural muscles. But because they're working with the other muscles, everything's in an integrated way, which makes it more, um, you know, holistic and more efficient. So that's why nothing is very hard or fast. Nothing's totally that way or this way. Yeah, but when we're thinking of the body, you need a different combination of the muscles so everything's working in tandem. All right, so, so um, yeah, when we're looking at posture, the ideal posture is a situation where we're in a good alignment, and because of our good alignment, we're able to hold the position over a long period of time. Because we're able to hold the position over a longer period of time, um, we're able to be more efficient in what we're doing. And also the less at risk we are from any injuries. Yeah. 
but not everyone has an ideal posture. Some people are part-time ideal postures. Some people are no-time ideal posture. Um, and, you know, you've got a whole other range of people that might have um, disabilities, that might have pain or discomfort or muscle shortening or tightening or there's a whole range of things which will take us from the ideal posture. But the ideal posture is, you know, it's the benchmark of what we should be striving towards. Even those of us with the best posture, we're not always in the ideal posture because sometimes the muscles might fatigue and we adopt another posture which might be less ideal but might feel more energy um, efficient at the time. However, anything from the ideal posture might not be energy efficient for a long, oh, bless me, period of time. So we've got the flat back posture here. And as you can see, compared to the ideal posture where you've got your natural kyphosis, which is in the upper thoracic spine, and our natural lordosis, which we see in the lumbar spine, <coughs> this person is very straight, yeah? And we can see um, because of that straightness, it can cause pressure in the vertebra. So that flexibility and that bend of our spine allows things to compress a little bit and then extend a little bit, but have that a little bit of give where something totally straight doesn't really have much give and that can cause problems. Um, another common posture we always see is um, we got this forward head posture. Now, in a world where everyone's on the computer and everyone's texting, you know, you, we do see a lot more people with, you know, this protruding neck posture, you know. Instead of being upright and back, we're seeing it constantly being pushed forward. And again, that, that, that develops other problems, you know, such as tension headaches, more than likely by the time, you know, that group of people get older, you know, they're probably going to be at more at risk of potential syncope, which is, you know, like the dizziness caused by, you know, the blood, you know, not, not efficiently going to the brain. Because what we have here, you know, we have a little bit of a kink, a natural kink, right at the, you know, cervical region. And then that's just to, you know, again, allow a natural give. But where someone's neck is so forward, you know, it disrupts that natural kink, which again can cause problems where if someone gets up too quickly and, you know, things are overly stretched in the not so right position, then one might be prone to dizziness, etc. Um we could, this is a military back, um, and that's basically here where you can see the pelvis rotated a little bit too far forward. Um, also, we can see this as well, where the pelvis goes forward, is when someone has an increased lordosis. And this, you know, is very common in, um, you know, the indigenous women of the world you know, and you you can see this, a prime example is just how easy it is for a baby to sit in that part of the back. And again, adopting a Western lifestyle where one is always sitting, etc., and all these other bad habits associated with that, that can cause problems because the problems one will get is, you know, more pressure developing in the lower back you know, etc. And that pressure in the lower back can cause things like, you know, back pain, degeneration, and even things like predispose one to um, problems like sciatica. Um, then we've got the sway back posture. And what you can see here is, you know, a little bit of a hunch developing here, but a sway back posture is you notice with the legs a little bit angled forward, but the body angled a little bit back. So if I was to stand and demonstrate it, it's kind of more of that kind of leaning back posture that we have here. You know, not forward, but 
and more leaning back. And again, that's going to cause a lot of pressure around that thoracic spine here. And yeah, this is just, again, over-exaggeration of kyphosis here and low dose. To see it with the combination of that. So again, um, this is another example of bad posture and good posture. And just looking at this here, in this diagram where it says improved memory, anywhere you're getting more blood flow or better blood flow to the brain is going to help memory. So that's the way it really helps with the memory. Um, lower stress levels. Again, in optimal posture, you're not going to have so much tension. And, you know, when the body is stressed, it carries tension. So the more tension we have in the body, the more stress we're going to be. A lot of the time we're just thinking of stress as external. You know, it might be the work colleague. It might be the friends. It might be the family. It might be the driver that cut you off in the middle of the road. But we fail to look at the stress that we create internally, which is like a feedback loop reminding us of, you know, the stress that we hold within our body. So, for example, you know, if you have tension in the body, that tension, you're not going to, it's going to manifest as being uncomfortable. Being uncomfortable is going to manifest as, you know, increased levels of pain if that goes on for a period of time your body can change its perception to pain which will make things a little bit more hypersensitive and appear a little bit more painful because we've not dealt with the problem now that pain is going to make us further feel a little bit more stress and then that stress is going to you know help to recreate that cycle until we can break out of it you know and it's again just an, another example you know a person who's dehydrated you know because you know the ph of the cells will change things become more ac acidic within the body again that's another way that we create that internal stress within ourselves so it's not always thinking about stress that we're getting outside of us but it's looking really at the stress we're creating ourselves and then we're you know, that further feedback loop continues to happen. Whereas the stress outside, you know, that can be gone just like that. Whereas the stress that we create inside, that's more than likely to live with us for a little while. Yeah. And then again, increase energy and happiness with the correct posture. One thing I haven't touched on with is the meridians and the meridians being energy pathway within the body you know, and you can see how it's linked with blood, the vessels, etc., and linked with things like the myofascia. But when we're more upright, you know, everything's stretched nicely. There's, you know, more of a free flow of energy. And the way we know, even when we're looking at energy, um, you know, if I, you know, had this like this, you know, in a very straight line, you know, we can almost kind of perceive energy going up and down this border. But as soon as I do something like this, you know, we can see how that energy, even, you know, through the vision, how there's not that nice flow. And that's like the body, that's the way energy works. You know, it works in, you know, it works in curves as well. But the more crumpled something is, the less energetic flow that we're going to get. Yeah. So uh, this one, yeah, this is basically just showing, um, again, going by the alignment of the spine, um, this is a diagram just showing how much pressure is placed on the, inter, you know, our intervertebral discs at different um, postures. So lying down, you know, if we was just to lie down, we can see this is the most relaxed position, hence why we sleep in this position, you know. Um, 
And, you know, they say that when we sleep and we wake up, we're a little bit taller in the morning compared to when we're at the end of the day where we shorten a little bit. I forgot the exact figures, but there's definitely, we're definitely taller in the morning compared to, you know, late in the evening or at night. And that's because we haven't got pressure on our intervertebral disc. As we stand, there's more pressure. As we bend forward, and you only need to test it yourself and feel where you saw the pressure. Hence why, you know, when we're walking, we ideally want to walk in this posture as opposed to walking around bent over. You know, because if we do, we're going to feel a lot more pressure on our disc. And then this is where, you know, between here and here, we see that as people's posture, as we get older, develops into something that might resemble more like this, there's a quicker spiral downwards to the posture becoming worse compared to when it's more upright. Again, if we hold something in the hands, we're going to feel more pressure in the intervertebral discs. Again, when we're sitting down, there's so much pressure going through the spine. But we can see how when we're sitting down, there's more pressure going through the spine compared to standing. Hence why nowadays, especially since COVID, we see more people with standing desks because everyone's appreciated by now that too much sitting is not good for the back. Now, no one sits like this. We more sit like this, not necessarily with the hands down, but forward with the hands out in front of us. Again, this is causing more pressure on our spine. And then again, if you was to sit and then hold a weight, again, it's a, little, a lot more pressure. Um, and this pressure, I think we touched on this maybe a few weeks back, but we can see that this pressure leads to the slow degeneration of our disc, which can eventually lead to osteophritis. So I'll just quickly explain, here's normal. Here we have the signs of wear and tear. And, you know, if we had to do an MRI in probably everyone's back over, they say 30, we might see some slight degeneration happening. That's why we don't just scan people for an MRI just without any symptoms, because, you know, we probably scare more people than is necessary. Um, again, that will develop into a bulging disc, um, you know, further down the degeneration. And then that bulging disc can become, you know, herniated. And it's when it becomes herniated, that's when it can start pressing on the um, nerve roots, which will cause things like sciatica. And then here, when there's a loss of the you know, the fluid within the disc or the gel-like substance, then we can get more of the thinning and then that's where the bones will rub on the bone and cause osteophritis. The more we get bones rubbing on the bones, then we can get like, you know, like two tectonic plates. Then we can get little bone spurs, which further are like little added nodules, which can further rub on each other, creating more pain. So this is why good posture is paramount mount. On this side, we see, you know, the normal um, or a better or a healthier um, intervertebral disc. Um, and on this side, we can see a, you know, worse off uh, vertebrae, yeah? So not intervertebral discs, that's the bits in between, but vertebrae I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, just move that one out of the way. So yeah, here we can see as we get further degeneration, that degenerative process I'm talking about, we can see now this is affecting the nerve root, which will cause all your neurological symptoms. Yeah, so simple way or simple thing to think about is why we need to adopt a good posture. Um, so way, one way you can measure whether your posture is good or not, um, a plumb line is what, um, I don't know if they use it now, I guess they do, 
but builders would use a plumb line just to see how straight something is. Um, and if we use have in our mind an imaginary plumb line, which is, you know, something and it's got like a long string down, which is weighted, we can see that the most ideal posture is a plumb line going through the ears, through the shoulder joint, and centrally through the trunk, through the greater trochanter on our hips, centre but slightly forward of the knee, and then a little bit forward of our ankle bone here. So that's just a nice way to see whether you've got a good posture. Here, what we can see here is this neck is a little bit far forward. Um, we can also see from what the picture is trying to depict is that there's a bit of kyphosis of the back where the vertebrae, the thoracic spine is a little bit curved. And then what we can see here, this is more coming over to the abdomen a little bit forward of the anterior, um, sorry, the greater trochanter. And yeah, this, I mean, it's not the best diagram to tell the truth because they're using a cartoon depiction, but it's meant to depict um, an incorrect posture. So anything which is not kind of following this rule is, you know, away from the norm. And it's remembering there's no real such thing as normal. There's just really, you know, more extremes and, you know, significant changes which can cause some discomfort. So it's not the total rule of thumb because we've got all different shapes and anatomy. But, you know, we can use that as a general rule for where we should be. One might have. But, yeah, it's one of them topics that, yeah, you, you can go into so many different layers yeah, or complexity and it's about keeping it simple I think the most interesting thing actually with about the post is when we start to learn it by correcting the posture you know I think in this world of problems a lot of the time we focus so much on the problems itself and the problems are there you, we don't need to learn about the problem so much because, you know, if you've, you're developing bad posture, you sh you will know what problems you have. You know, it's there with you every day. So I'm not going to tell you better about the problems you've already got. But what is also more helpful is when we learn how to correct our posture and we learn about optimal posture, this is kind of where our focus should be. And then this is where things like Pilates, Tai Chi, yoga, these are the things that we have to really integrate ourselves into to really get an appreciation of what posture should be like. Because most of us are experiencing posture only from one spectrum or one polarity. And that polarity is the polarity of discomfort, pain, problems. And the reason I know that is because, you know, you just have to go out there in the street. And once you reach above a certain age, it's almost like happy birthday. Now your possible problems can begin, you know. But by learning ways to mitigate that, that's the only way we're really going to appreciate all of the, the things, you know. Um, but is there any questions on that at all? Before we go to the metaphysics, yeah, if there's any um, a little, any confusion, best to say now, because <laughs> the metaphysics is, yeah, another story. Oh, y yes, thank you for, let me unmute you. Uh, oops, sorry, I'm muted and I'm yeah. muted. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I Good just evening. wanted to ask <clears throat> about correct posture for sleeping then. What, what's the correct posture? All right. So, um, I mean, there's different posture for sleeping. Um, the way I'm going to answer your question 
is from a problematic point of view. Um, so when I see a lot of clients, a lot of clients might develop a lot of postural pain, um, definitely from how they're sleeping, or if they've gone on holiday somewhere and they've slept in a different bed, or if they've purchased, or if they're sleeping in a new bed, or if they've changed their mattress. That's one way that people can get, you know, you know, pain from sleeping. Another way is if they've injured their back or injured an area in their body, and that injury has forced them to adopt a different posture, you know. So that's another way people can get a lot of discomfort. When we're looking at, let's say, general back pain, one advice or two sets of advice I might give initially is, let's imagine, lower back pain. Sleeping, if they're sleeping on their side, to sleep with a pillow between their knees. And the reason for that is because, if you can see my hands, a lot of the time when people are sleeping, let's say that's the upper body, and then this is the lower body, you know, there might be an element of, from the weight of the legs, etc., an element of rotation. And that element of rotation in the spine itself can cause, you know, further that discomfort. So what one might do is sleep with a pillow between their knees just to help correct that spinal alignment a little bit better. Another thing that people can do if they've got problems with the lower back, is if they sleep on their back, just by sleeping or with their knees bent, what that does, that basically stops that arching or that gap between the back. You know, so if you imagine if one's on their back, there might be a little bit of a space between their lower back. But by putting a pillow underneath their legs, that helps to crack the pelvis a little bit and then you know, get that back in a little bit of a better alignment. I know um, in one of Sahu's presentation from, I think it was a little while ago, maybe on Leon's, one of Leon's talk, and I know Sahu, you was describing about sleeping on the back is, you know, there's some aspects that tie in with the metaphysics but that seemed to be, from what I got from that presentation as well, one of the most, you know, natural ways that people used to sleep in ancient times, you know. So, and, you know, there are many reasons for that. Again, with the presentation, you can see that when one does sleep on their back, you can see how everything's so much more relaxed. You know, there's less pressure on the intervertebral discs. At the same time, if we compare that to other postures, such as sleeping on the stomach, you know, the stomach's been more associated with other discomforts. Um, me, myself, I prefer to sleep on my side. And then there's the arguments between sleeping on your left side and sleeping on the right side. And then with the, you know, I think with the um, Chinese medicine, it talks a lot about sleeping on the left side, you know, of the body from an energetic perspective. Um, and I think that might be to do with drainage, etc. But again, that, that will come, that's um, bearing in mind that there's no other problems. So in terms of having a problem, it's easy to justify how to sleep. Um, but from myself a comfort level and from what how I regularly sleep, personally, I sleep on my left side, you know, because I think from an energetic perspective, um, it's better. I need to get the research about that. Um, but then also, you know, there's some people that will vouch for more sleeping on the back. What, what, what would you say to that, Sahu? Oh, um, well, I sleep on my back. And I sleep on my back with no pillow. 
and I've been observing that one there for a little while. And I used to sleep on my side, but when I slept on my side, I found a lot of discomfort in my shoulders and my neck. And no matter what type of pillow I'm using, I'd always find some kind of discomfort. And then trans um, going into lying into the back, I found different discomfort, but those discomfort were more manageable in the long run than actually doing it on my side. I think energetically, because I was thinking about this ironically during the week, um, mm -hmm. the other night when I was going to lie down, and I was saying to myself, man, we in the fetus, and we like in a sideline position, um, because we're in we're in the womb, it's, it's only left and right because of whatever mum's doing. <clears throat> so we're lying across mm -hmm. sideways and we're curled mm -hmm. up. But we we come out of womb and we mature and develop and we become a uh, uh, immortal or a superior being. And are we still curled up? Or are we still sideline? This is what I was wondering to myself. But as I'm lying on my back, um, I had some other thoughts that entered into my consciousness. And that is of being uh, um, developing beyond the fetus stage into um, God domain, if I should say it like this. And how do we transform into those stages? Everything's always about alignment. Mm. So with that one there, the only thing I can add to what you said about the, di the different sleeping things, there's only one thing that I suggest a bonus to what you say there, is that if you can, if you, Sleeping on the back, because some people snore and all that stuff there, and they're breathing and all that stuff, and they have a lot of stuff going on. That's the sinuses, and that causing a lot of other stuff, headaches, tetanus, and all these different things going in the head. Um, you can get a triangle. That's like straight, flat triangle that comes up, and then you can lie on it, where you can still have the head alignment, so your head, your neck isn't folded forward because you're on a pillow still. So your head has still got a straight alignment, but mm. your back is raised. So mm. your back is continually raised and then you have your um, your legs straight. And that mm. takes out the pressure out of the lower back. It takes off the desire to turn left and right as well when you're mm. on there. And it also improves the breathing tremendously. But all these are different stages of, of, of going through your physical body and see what you can achieve. Like all of them are transitional. Nothing's you overnight. That you said that because that's how we would have respiratory patients. Yeah. On the wards in that trying, they will have a bed device specifically that will make them on their back. But in fact, the bed technology will do that anyway. We five degrees. Yeah. It's true. And that, that is a good position for them. I think that's important, even if you don't have a respiratory problem, because I think it aids your breathing. Because when you lie mm -hmm. on your left and your right, you get compression either side, whether it's your spleen, you're compressing, compressing on your left, or whether it's your liver, you're compressing on your right hand side. And it's compression. So um, the only time I lie on side doing that, yeah, I'll do this going to sleep and I wake up okay, or it moved, is with a foam roller. If I'm releasing my side, I will lie on my side and go to sleep on my side uh, maybe for an hour or something. I don't know when I'll wake up or when it moves. Mm -hmm. if, if I have not moved at all, I just wake up and the area feels compressed and a bit um, um, lack of circulation. I move and then I feel the area just filling up with blood and I, it feels really um, alleviated. It's weird because I don't think that should be done unless you're properly in physically good health as in your body. I don't think you should be lying, going to bed with a foam roller and putting yourself in uh, because of the spine. Boy, well, that was a lot of information for about sleeping, isn't it? <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot going on, but that, that 70, I think it's a 70 or the pressure on the body if you lie flat. Because mm. I'm diagramming lying flat. I think the least pressure yeah you feel your your back muscle stimulated if you have not moved yeah mm. you feel your um your lax trapezius, your your erector spine there you feel all that because it's compressed into the bed or into the floor you feel mm. up like those muscles are being stimulated <laughs> and yeah. one more thing one more thing um 
it was the other night, I was lying down and it's the same posture again. And I was straightening my neck and I was adjusting myself and I was lengthening the base of my skull and I was, I was uh, flattening my body and softening into the bed. And I felt my neck release. And I said to myself, that is deep. <laughs> you know, Christos, I never expected you yeah, to, to feel, you know, like the, 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 <laughs> the vertebrae up there just give. And I'm like to myself, wow, I, I, wow. I don't think I would have experienced that if I was on a, a pillow. Mm. I, was just, I was just on the mattress and my head was in that position there. I just didn't realise it was even in that position. To, it was locked, let's say, mm. for it to release like that. But yeah, man, I, I, I hear it open up and release. <laughs> no, oh. hopefully that answered your question, thank you for... Yeah. Yes, yes, that was yeah. that's a lot to think about. That's a lot to think about. But I was just um had in mind your image of the force is it that goes through the body. You showed mm -hmm. the lying posture on the back as almost mm -hmm. what was I mean, like yeah, just explain what, what it represented when you were lying down and the force uh, on the body oh or gosh. something. It's a physics thing. I, I keep forgetting the terminology. I can find out for you, but it's it's a, it's a measurement of pressure, basically. Measurement of pressure, it's, right? It's twenty five okay. something something. Um, yeah. Anyone that understands a, a little bit of the physics terminology would just pick see it right now. Yeah. Um, you know, in the real world, we do. You know, physics, we don't measure it like that. You know, oh, we sure. just measure it in the tightness that we're feeling, the degeneration that's happening in our clients. But it, it's a terminology. Um, it's, a pre it's basically pressure. And it's directly, this is taken from a research paper, you know, so it's not just a random number. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, okay, well, let me go into the presentation and get into the the internal aspect of this story. Our time discussing there, the external aspect. Mm. And to be honest, the whole thing is all connected up. It's not like I said there's any differences going on out here. Oh, well, it's a continual system, isn't it? And that continual system is from internal, uh, from external to internal, from internal to external, however you're looking at the thing, but it's a continual loop, both affecting each other. So as we, Christos, um, basically broke down, I went through the system really well, the muscular system, the only space and the bowl, the skeletal system, and the structure itself. And these are just various layers. So we have our skeletal system, but then from there, we have our fascial system. And the fascial system, which we've discussed many times in the past, is like filling the space between the bone and the muscle. Between that space there, you have superficial and you have deep, and you have visceral or fascia that is around your internal organs. And all this truly connects still to the bone. Somehow everything is still all connected together, like an endless web. There's like no part that is not connected to another part. And as a, as a result, we have a system which is continuous. Um, from a therapeutic point of view, we look at it from a, a biotensegrity. So then all these different systems all connect up together and have this buoyancy between them, which allows the system to be adaptable and also malleable, which is really important because with this malleable system, we're, we're able to evolve, sorry, miss and not experience or reduce our experience of an injury and illness. So, the, so what Christos brought down is vitally important to understand these structures the muscles and how they interact. So as we have a, a good, a better appreciation of muscles, 
which are connected to the um, bone, between this, between the muscle, we have what we can see as the blue. We have um, fascia, which connecting this, this bone and muscle together. And then also between the face, sorry, between the actual bone itself, you have connective tissue because fascia has different levels of different types of um, fascia where it comes under connective tissue. But for us here, with this fascia system, we need it to be, as we said, malleable. We need it to have the ability to mold and adjust. But what happens, it gets stuck in certain places. But if we look at it from a functional point of view, because we are still, um, at the moment, looking at it from an external point of view. But from an external point of view, the superficial fascia is transmitting information from one location to another through receptors. And this constant communication is what keeps the body optimal. Whereas when these things air, um, have strain, injury, when there's restriction, when there's a scar, all these things here interfere with the, with the frequency or the voltage or the currents that moves through the body. But in our looking to create a body which is more healthy, one of the most important things is for our fascial system to be flexible. And we can, um, there's many different ways to test our, our, our fascia. But when we're going through fascia, if we roll through the superficial skin layer and we get to an area that's really painful or it's stuck and you can't move through, because it's like you're, you can roll the fascia underneath it. And when you're rolling, it's like you're folding over and going under the skin, it's like kneading. But that's on a superficial level. But this, this, a whole fascia system is, is a framework of the body or a structure of the body which is primary to health. And we have many different, um, well, fascia in throughout the body looks different, but it generally looks like this. That's why they refer to it as like a web. And we have um, fascia, we have myofascia, a myofascia connects to muscle. But all this fascia here, when, when these, what we can see as these web-like tentacles, when they become fused together, stuck, because this is how they look naturally. But when they become fused and stuck, well, they're unable to move and flow. This is when, again, illness comes. And when we're looking at fascia, and muscle together, it looked like this on a deeper level. So whether muscles are voluntary or involuntary, they both have a, a similar organization going on. And our ability to make our muscles function more effectively is through fascia. Fascia is like the bag that wraps around the body. So when, when let's say the bag is torn, then the muscle underneath it has a space to come through, which causes a problem. Let's say muscle itself is torn, then the fascia is stuck to the muscle, and again, that causes a problem. And these are all problems on various levels from, to, from severe to minor acute injuries. It all varies. So if you see at the top there, we have a similar thing going through or going on here where the fascia is leaking through, or that there has been on the top image there, when we have a damage or an injury or a tear, we strain an area, and this happens over a longer period of time. This isn't a sudden process, a couple of months, for, the, for it to be, have its, um, to, to lay its seeds, let's say. But something like this can take place where the fascia itself becomes denser and thicker. But through treatment therapy, through Tai Chi, Qigong, through deep breathing, Pilates, through the yoga practices, 
other activities do, but we're talking about here um, low low to medium intensity activities, low to medium activities, helping to realign the structure. So then the communication between muscle bone and the, the largest organ on the body, the skin, can communicate effectively. And this is how it becomes, as you see on the bottom one, when the, when the fascia itself is restored or when the body goes through its healing process from an injury or when it's normalized, we don't have through the um, adipose tissue layer beneath the skin, that yellow looking air layer there. We don't have um, dense collagen or dense fascia through there. So the air is more supple. But there's one area, because we're just going to just touch one area in this presentation of importance when we're looking at this fascial system and our structure, which, in, which impacts our internal alchemy and our internal structure. And this is the, the lumbar, lumbar, lumbar thoracic fascia or lumbar dorsal fascia. Then both is the same, two names for the same part, which is outlined in the center. And these general, these lighter areas to the red are, are areas of fascia being demonstrated. And this lower one here, we're looking more into the lower dantian or the lower elixir field. So we're going to investigate this, this lower elixir field structure and um, function and middle and touch a little on the upper area. But we're going to mainly talk about the fascial system, connective tissue and everything um, for, for the lower area and describe what it achieves when it reaches to the middle and to the upper areas. So when we're, we're misusing our body, this is the thing. We have bad habits that we practice during the day. Where we will just bend over. And even doing a stretch like this and holding that stretch, we do this in Tai Chi, but one has to be mindful. So this is just demonstrating different ways in which we can actually bend and pick stuff up without affecting our general structure, without affecting our spine and our back. Through practicing these different ways here. We become more aware of our structure. So all these way, all these different um, correct methods that you can see, if we can observe how the back maintains a natural curve to it. And it also demonstrates there's loads of different ways to actually pick stuff up correctly. It seems like there's more ways to pick up stuff correctly than there is to pick up things incorrectly. Picking up stuff incorrectly seems like it's just a bad habit that we've just practiced. And once we get through, get over this bad habit and we start to incorporate our system more consciously, then the energy flows more effectively. And it's because we're actually challenging and using our muscles through the day more effectively which is re-energizing the body. Simple activity like balancing, stimulating the lower limb. So as we move on, I want to go into the energetic aspect because those are the things that impact us. And when we live in every day, we're doing these things and really causing a, a malalignment. So as was demonstrated earlier with that piece of paper, and you can see a straight line and you can see energetically in your mind eye that the energy is spiraling upwards or it's moving upwards yeah but there's an action that's coming up and down and we can see that on a straight line but it's seeming like and if it's a circle we see the similar thing if we're looking on the outside of the circle but as we are upright beings then there is an alignment that takes place between our energetic centers that makes us more energetic efficient 
And with this, many different systems have named these different parts of the body. Some focus on the other parts more than um, yeah, other parts. But the names on the outside are the general names in traditional um, Qigong and Neigong practice. And also in um, traditional medicine, Chinese medicine. We have the lower dantian, the middle, and the upper dantian, which we're going to go into in a few moments. So those three dantians that we're looking at all correlate to these three main points here. So when we're looking at this lower dantian, we're connecting, when we're doing um, standing, stance work, when we're walking, so we, we are aware of this in our training, but we cross that information over into our everyday activity. So when our weight is not flat footed and when the weight is not on the heel, so we're back, but when, sorry, the weight is slightly on the front triangle, more so, that means you're, you can have your heels off the ground. You don't have to, but it's awareness that your toes are spread and they're active. When you have this contact, yeah, we're activating energy flow. We call that point in their bubbling spring. From the spine, from the pelvis. So from the spine, um, going up along the arms, we have in the center of our palm, where we do if we're looking at from a, a therapeutic or a healing point of view, where we do healing work, where we um, touch somebody to express love, care, compassion, where we want to sue somebody to make them feel better, where we're rubbing our knee or our palms together to generate heat. That particular point in the center of the palm there, if we could refer to that as the Palace of Great Reward. And when the structure is aligned internally, and when the shoulders are more released and there's less tension around the chest and the heart area, and the blood can flow unimpeded along the arms, and the fascial system and the myofascial system along the arms have less restriction, then the energy that flows to these points there starts to, starts to grow. You, you feel this energetically when you do uh, certain movements. You feel this, this pulsation from this point here. And then we have the final point really um, connected to the upper dantian. So we have bubbling spring connected mainly to the lower dantian, palace of great reward connected to the middle dantian. And we have the celestial convergence connected to the upper dantian. Now we're going to touch this one at the end, um, this celestial convergence, and it's really connected with the pineal gland. And when neck and head is aligned and the, the body, should I say the neck and shoulders are empty, we're able to connect this point along our central column. So these three points here, really are our main points of awareness. So if, even if we are standing and we are visualizing being upright, we have this idea that it's not coming from the center here being pulled up, but it's being pulled up from this, that same point, the celestial convergence as the chin comes in to, to align your structure. But that alignment, from the spine is really what you're achieving when so you're upright standing and you have this upright alignment but if you want to to mimic it and you're lying down well that's really achieved lying on your back and ultimately with no pillow and if you don't have pillow or if you do have pillow sorry then a, a thin one if you're lying on the floor then it's like a thin book if you want to start that process there then it's like a 10 minute practice and you just build it into your, your sleeping process over a couple months or years. 
not to say that it's just a sudden transition. You get a lot of strain. But then when all that happens, um, all these points from the from the foot and from the palm radiate. So we have the same concept we're always trying to maintain, which is the lengthening of the spine, the lengthening of the spine, the loosening of the limbs. And through that, we're able to connect. So we're going to um, go into more of the, the mystical aspects for a moment when we're looking into structural alignment or internal alchemy alignment. So when all these structures are lined up and everything's um, on, on, a, on, a, on a gradient, on a path, um, can we say perfection? Or oh, sorry, should I say, can we say there's no such thing as perfect perfection? More the idea of perfecting, but even along that, the idea of perfecting each person's own perception. Each person's own perception is only limited by their own perception or by their own thought. So a person will only create to what they know within themselves they can create. And then that would be the ultimate perfection of what you're trying to perfect. And this is, in this case, your inner world. So from an alchemical point of view, this whole process here is to awaken something inside of us. And that's to awaken inside, deep inside that we all have this gift from birth. Some awaken really young, which is few, and they can go dormant. Some people, it's been dormant most of their life and it awakens. But once this inner child awakens or this embryo take, starts to take form, and it takes form because we engage in spiritual practices. And it's not necessarily religious practices that awaken this inner consciousness, this inner world. This inner world is, is awoken through a metaphysical or an alchemical process which involves certain perceptions to be appreciated. So in the lower Dantian, the perception that we are working on is uh, uh, fear, anger, being ungrounded, being unsettled, depression or the lung of metal. But those five different elements, we're looking to harmonize them and they are that which creates this embryo this internal structure now. So to create an energetic internal structure, one has to stabilize these things there. And this is what we're talking about because there are stages of, 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 of releasing or there's stages of purifying your internal world, the stuff that you've gone through. The more, the more we purify and cleanse the stuff here, the greater we form a fetus within, an energetic fetus. And it's a metaphor, but also it is real because within you, everything is real. The world that you see outside is inside of you. So the world you see inside of you is the world outside. So as a result, this, this fetus within you is growing because you are purifying or releasing the trauma that's taking place. And as you start to balance all that stuff out, a world forms inside of you, a world of your own perception, a world of your own creating, a world of wonderful and weird creatures and weird beasts, of mystical lands, of landscapes unseen before only by yourself. It's only formed initially through this worker and I know I'm talking from a point of view of Nadan or um, internal alchemy from uh, utilizing the Taoist philosophy to explain this, but it doesn't matter what culture or what religion and how you describe it, it's the same thing. Whatever world you're in, whatever culture you reside in, 
the template is given to us by society, which creates your inner world. You can create naturally your own inner world, your own rules. You can bend and manipulate reality because of the rules that you create within. But as we are well-programmed, all of us, then reality is as it is because we all assigned to that programming there. On a metaphysical level, because so there are many planes of reality, this plane be one, one frequency on a dial of many different frequencies going on. We are tuned in here. So through, if I just backtrack a second, so through this, um, loosen up the structure, because it's not to say you can't be um, in hospital, on your deathbed, maybe with some ailment, like cancer, or you're suffering from a goal, a gold stone, a gold, a gold stone, or something, and that you can't have profound vision, or perceive someone's own life, or have um, amazing perception on reality. Yeah, not to say those things can happen, but what would happen if that person was more aligned, or if their body was in a more vibrant space, then it would just be more profound. And that's how simple the thing is. It would just be more profound. And in most cases, most probably not, because not, not, we, we haven't trained. In most cases, we're not prepared to experience or receive that level of information. So not to say that somebody can't experience it because they're, in, they're ill. It's, yeah, no, you can. It's just that you would have experienced or seen or had a better understanding if you were more um, structurally aligned, or if you were able to, if you engaged or practiced something for much sooner. Mm. So initially, the lower dantian is all about activating this immortal embryo, and it's and from a physical point of view, yeah, because my words have been generally um, metaphysical, but from a physical point of view, this substance is referred to as a substance and it's a substance which is created within the body internally and it's this substance which circulates through the body so this embryo actually is formed every month just as that lyric said at the beginning observing the moon and aligned it is like every month this um, cycle takes place and there is a, a moment when there's a three, four day period where if you align yourself with this, with this energy, then this em while this embryo is being formed, it creates an elixir, a precious ele elixir, which is extremely valuable to the body. And this takes place, so you have to just know your, your star constellation. Wherever your star sign is, you have to look up on the um on an on a astrolabe or on a looking into one of those astrology, one of those astrology um what do they call it software programs where you can see when the moon is in alignment with your constellation and it's a two, three day moment every single month. But when that happens there and we align now internally so during that period of time we are less engaged in outworldly things or the stresses and the problems in the world around us and we're more focused in our inner world then that which is formed is more uh, nutritious to our being and it's like a it's like a um a oily neurological it's like it has a mix of everything in this actual in this actual um substance this primer material but again this the presentation is not really about that but the beautiful thing is that once that world is formed yeah and there's a there's a cycle going on 12 times a year 13 times however you want to look at that one there you're um receiving a top up or you're being rejuvenated during that period there, all these worlds start to light up. 
So first we have to light up the lower dantian, the lower elixir field. Then we have to light up the middle. Because once you fill up this lower sphere of reality and you're contented and you, you, the way in which you envision the world, yeah, has transformed from a state of oppression to a place of courage, resilience, and confidence, satisfaction, always being gra um, grateful for everything. Once this world has been filled with this, then it can fill up the second world of the heart. But see the thing of the, the heart here, yeah? that heart demons and such things can be formed when the first world is not properly created. If this first, first world is not properly created, and we've jumped, we've jumped spears into the heart or to the upper elixir field, then we have issues. And that is because we have confrontations, we have arguments, we experience different things going on, and it affects our heart. It, it affects the way in which the energy is flowing in that space there. So I refer to them thing there as um, some kind of energetic vampire can be formed, or a heart demon. Something which is holding you back inevit inevitably one way or another. But once this space is filled with the chi or the energy, our heart is stabilized with the earth. We've created a stable earth within us, within our world. So within us, we've created a stable earth reality. Yeah. Our heart internally is merged with the heart of the earth. The frequency of our heart is vibrating in rhythm with reality around us. Stabilization. Like um, once we experience this as the heart feels, then generally we are more compassionate, more calmer, more loving, more understanding. And it may not be understood, but loving and being compassionate doesn't mean being weak and soppy and floppy, or whatever yeah, you want to put that. Sometimes it means being stern. That is how the love is. But once you've created your inner world, you have the confidence and the strength. And this all comes from the lack of distraction from outside of you. The niggles in the body, the stresses. And, you know, when these things are there, these, these physical ailments externally, the, the working on the inner world and the understanding of how these things arrive and how these things, how these things develop, understanding the route to their development will, will all be done in reflection or in some kind of internal um, meditation. And that will really stabilize lower Dantian. That would stabilize, but it's not like say we dwell in one world constantly. So as that's stabilized and the heart is expanding and developing and growing, then we can move up to the upper elixir field. That world there is really breaking through the limitations of reality. And it's hard to break through the limitations of reality when you haven't even broken through your own shortcomings or even grounded with the reality of Earth. To ground with the reality of Earth, to stabilize your heart with Earth, earth heart, or um, trees, the air, insects, with a flower, with a sea creature, to, to have some kind of appreciation of these things on all their fundamental levels, to have the ability to contemplate for a moment the perfection of a cockroach as it irritates you is a weird thing. But if you can achieve that, though, then we stabilize a, a heart energy. And we're not just irritated in a lower Dantian space. From there, because you would think it's a mind space, isn't it? Because it is mind, because the whole thing's mind. But upper Dantian, once you enter into there, yeah, 
the neck thing they become an illusion. The the cockroach become an illusion. Thing's not even there, but the thing is there. The only thing that's real is the essence of all things. And it has no form shape as we see it uh, in a physical form. That's the shape it has physical. But it truly has no shape or form when you enter into upper dante and hurting energy and light and vibration and sound. That's why the illusion is easy to break once you enter into upper dantian. So the, the inner structure is going on. So those are the, the basic um, worlds and how they're filled through um, training to, to enhance this, to enhance this, the three areas that we have to be mindful of. The inner structures of the inner world. So there are three structures that we need to be aware of. So can we describe lower dantian? You can just look at an, uh, the pelvic diaphragm, this activity down here, this muscle, doing all the work to um, push the energy up, let's say. And we can locate that from the kidney, navel, and the genitals, a mecha triangle in the center, center of the body, say lower dantians in this base here, the energy flowing up and down from that, that location there. With that lower dantian, itself is is physical and not physical real and not real it's a um it's an, an energetic space of expansion yeah it's also a world of its own it's a world that exists with life form but it's also just a world of light and energy it depends how your how your mind or how your awareness, what stage of awareness you're you're fluctuating from. You can just get stuck because you haven't seen it yet. But we can just get stuck and perceive that the space is just empty, that like it's just muscle and everything around it, and we're just stretching tissue and muscle. But in order to overcome that whole hurdle, there you have to just dive in. And just perceive to believe for a moment and just trod forward and see how the, the thing unfold. Mm. And then we have the middle area, the middle elixir field, which is controlled and mainly operated from the, the diaphragm. And that is all stimulating the heart, which is allowing energy to flow also along the arms, which is of vital importance. Between this heart here, this heart world, this heart here, energy from up come down, energy from below come up to stabilize this thing here. That's why it's always the, the, the major energy, the heartbeat, so to speak. That's why it's the, um, the major energy. But this, 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 if you can see on the on the conception vessel side, on the right hand side, you have this minus representing water. And on the right hand side, sorry, the left, we've got the plus. You have this governing vessel, which is fire. We have water and fire, the two elements that we're neutralizing or sorry, um harmonizing, balancing within. It's on a energetic structure level maintaining this 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 balance between these two energetic systems as we have a negative pole and a positive pole and that positive pole to recharge this on a structural level is to lie down with your head facing north your head facing north and your feet facing south Aligning yourself with the earth. That is just to recharge the structure, to recharge your body with earth, the earth field. If you put some magnets on the bed or you've got a grounding sheet that actually improves the function of restoring the body, allowing everything to flow. And then we have the last, the last one I want to go into, which is the, um, the, the throat area. 
the laryngeal diaphragm. You see, that area here where the trachea is, is an area that gets stuck for many of us. It's an area that needs to be re released. And it's the same head forward stuff, compression, strain from the way in which we carry stuff across our body. Now, all these things can cause the area to dysfunction, but it's a major diaphragm. And that third one is the gateway to the upper dantian. And once this, this area here is, is again loosened or is not functioning um, um, with strain or stress, the air can flow, everything can function more effectively, restoring the body again. So when we are practicing, this is how the process generally is going on. Like we breathe into Dantian and the energy goes up to the upper Dantian. Whereas well, we breathe in into Dantian, energy is coming up from up from the earth as well and circling. This is done when the boys. Um, so even if it's a feedback loop, 90 seconds. I know it's sometimes 10 minutes, five minutes, two minutes, um, an hour. Well, I would say 25 minutes is enough, but to be standing still. But even if it's a feedback loop, so a 90 seconds standing aligned and upright, or 90 seconds lying down flat, aligned with, with um, the earth structurally, will correct, connect one with the energetic structures of this earth. Mm -mm, and the plane around us. But when we're standing, you just have to balance because all this stuff here, if we're out of balance, the energy again doesn't flow appropriately. Yeah. All right. So this is the last one. So um, the upper dantian, the Tao column. So when when all these things are lovely, or even if you are in a dis-ease state and you are connected with your with your upper dantian, so you can perceive things beyond this reality, whether it's in your um, dreams, your visions of people, what they do, or other worlds. It's all coming from this connection there, from this upper dantian. And in um, Nagong, we refer to this as the Tao column. And it depends how high one Tao column ascends, depends on how um, the frequency of your body can receive. And it's different from your pituitary gland, which is your all-seeing eye, which allows you to perceive all things in this plane of reality here, in this 3D reality, your all-seeing eye. But your celestial eye is a different thing. And I mean, they cross over. So, so you can perceive with your all seeing eye, with your third eye, the astral plane or the dream plane or other planes. But to go beyond those planes or the astral plane is not the pituitary gland, it is the pineal gland or this Tao column that connects us to constellations and stars. The ability to go beyond this, this realm, to touch into other realms, to see different frequencies on this plane of reality is a pituitary gland thing. So even if we're um, changing the dial and we're seeing through this plane and we're seeing um, other stuff take place or vivid images, a lot of that is still pituitary gland. You're all seeing eye. That allows us to perceive, yeah, in this reality. But to go beyond that, there's this, this celestial eye, which connects to your celestial convergence, the bow shoe or the crown of the head. And this aligns up with polaris in some cases, but that's just the access point of alignment. This thing goes beyond there. And again, it's perception, isn't it, from one's experiences or what one has studied and what, we're, what we perceive to be. That's why the world exists inside of you. 
the structures and the things that manifest within only manifest within at this stage of our of, of being due to our perception or our thoughts of how we thought about stuff through reinforcing them. But when we are um, practicing what we just described, we are able to interfere with the program. We're able to change the frequency. We're able to reprogram the lower lips of field. We're able to reprogram the middle and activate the upper and align these structures. Ultimately, once the upper is uh, awoken, once the upper is awoken, then we have um, this immortal body idea going on. This body that is allowed to forever be present. So from the ancient perspective here, yeah, that this would this would mean that once when you die, you have a body to inherit. That's what that whole whole science is about. That all this work you're looking to do is so you can make a structure, a form, a body that is energetic outside the physical body that can carry on existing. This is the um this is the science of the internal arts. All right. I think I'm gonna end my presentation there. Let us see. If there are any um any 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 reasoning going on there. But that was that was again looking at the structure, you know. Yeah, no, it, it was interesting. It, it, it was good. Um, when you, it, it almost seems because when you, when you was talking about the high Dantian, I, I was reminiscing of being on the mountain. Yeah. The higher up I was, every, everything disappeared. It's true. In that yeah. lofty place. Everything disappeared. I mean, you know, you're looking down and you can no longer see the people. So the people's just am amalgamated into the mountain or become one with the scenery. And then you're up in the clouds and there's nothing really there. Mm. And you're still one with everything. Mm -mm. You know? That's how you get them transcendental experiences. They have to go to them, them, them locations in the world. Mm. You can experience that in a, in your in your yard, in a, your bed, in or in your sofa. Yeah, yeah. But I think you have to at least feel it, or you just describe there first. Mm. You have to you have to feel that feeling that you just described, and then you can recreate it within you, wherever you are. <laughs> Funny enough, I've, I've definitely felt that feeling in deep meditation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So it was familiar because, you know, I'm not going to lie, you know, as a person that do like roller coasters or anything or heights, you know, there was moments where I had to really recollect myself because I, I just found myself on the mountain. It's mm. not like I planned to be there. I wouldn't, in my logic, there's no reason to be on the mountain. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not a mountain goat, you know. <laughs> So I, I found myself, and then there were moments where I was like, oh, my goodness, I am high up, and this is steep. So then I had to close the eyes, breathe, and because it was already the oneness in the atmosphere, it was easy to remember, actually, no, you, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it's just interesting, as you you know, you when you're talking about the reality and you know the the energy behind things because then it was that that type of you know it was that oneness energy that I was feeling. Mm. And mm. yes, you can definitely recreate that experience <clears throat> in all situations. You know, um, but I do wonder. You know, sometimes when you're you've had a certain level of awareness for many years. 
you do reflect on <clears throat> what would it be like not to have that awareness. But once you've already had it, you've got it. <clears throat> so sometimes I wonder, and I see this in patients as well, <clears throat> where you know what you know, but it's really trying to make them understand what you know. And the only way for them to understand what you know is for them to have a level of trust in what you know and going through that experience themselves. Yeah, that's the one, isn't it? you got to go through that. Sometimes you got to set up the situation uh, for them to experience it, for them to appreciate that one there. you got to guide them along mm -hmm. the process there, give them the right advice in order for them yeah. to actually, especially when you're aware mm -hmm. and you can see what they what's required for them to take that next step forward. Yeah, yeah. So I, I do wonder, you know, if ev everyone understands what, what Sahu is talking about um, and if everyone's doing certain practices because I think that's the only way you really understand by doing some level of practice on it's a daily basis. When I describe some of this stuff, it's true. And it's somebody, because um, naturally we're not describing it to convince a person or anybody. Mm. But the whole idea is, even if I was not describing it externally out of my mouth and it's in circulating in my head and I'm thinking about this thing there, it's the, it, the question still arise. It's like, how can a person who has not invested time internally understand? Like, how can they even, how, could, how can they, like, man, it's just fooling yourself. You can only, they will say, a person can uh, go along and agree. But then that's, <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not, that's not truth or truthful. Mm. So that's not self-experienced. Therefore, you're you're still deluded. It's a delusion that you're you're either selling or that you've or you're um, perceiving. Mm. And the deep thing is, it doesn't take a long period of time to actually to experience these these subtle these subtleties. It's just mm. I want to bring it to your awareness. I mean, you can experience it right now. As soon as you said it, it can be experienced. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. As instant as that. But with that awareness, that's that's for somebody who's definitely embarked upon the path for a few moments, isn't it? Mm. But in in a in a in a breath, in a breath, they can transform their conscious state if mm. they want. To. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I think it's very important to <clears throat> do some of the practices such as the Tai Chi, the meditation, wh whatever it is, just mm -hmm. to get that full understanding, you know, unless the f full understanding is already understood, then that's a different under. But then there's different levels and yeah. you know, different degrees and and it continues. It's true, because we are ultimately talking about, on a basic level, mm. basic level, we're talking about um, alpha alpha brain waves transforming into theta brain waves on a mm. basic level. And you talk about this different thing to the, yeah, because, you know, um, when you go beyond that, you know, we're talking about gamma waves, isn't it, brain waves, mm. when we're going beyond the theta. But the theta, if a person can enter theta brainwave state, um, then they're ex then they're generally experiencing a lot of this stuff, whether that is through um, any any activity that they enjoy doing, baking a cake, um, be cooking um, food, creating clothing or music, entering the theta state into your own world. Mm into your own world you know the world only becomes now um highly tangible when it enters into a gamma gamma brainwave state hmm. and that's when it can truly influence the world isn't it um that influence of the world is harder to to stop but that theta brainwave influences the world still isn't it 
feet a brainwave. You can yeah. influence someone else's thoughts and perception or the state of their um, energetic body. Oh, yeah. Brainwaves. Yeah, but we're all influenced by art, music, by drama, plays. Mm. The architects and builder, buildings was all created in that state. Mm. And we're all influenced by it. Mm. In that bliss state. Mm. Yeah, so, um, well, I think we're going to be finishing up soon, you know, everybody. Mm. Mm. Anyone uh, write any questions in there? I haven't got a question, but what I what I do think um, these talks are so important because doing Tai Chi and also doing Pilates, you move your body, but you don't even know what muscle you're <laughs> moving. You don't even appreciate the movement and how the muscle actually works. And and to really, I think, benefit from from those um, exercises, you do need to understand a little bit more about the body because when you do get an injury, because you are going to at some point get some form of injury whilst doing it, you need to know where it is, what it is, and then you can start working to repair. But when you haven't got that knowledge or understanding then then those minor injuries become long term injuries because you're ignoring the signs because you don't know, you don't know how to appreciate what signs you're receiving so i thank you guys because there's been a few things over the couple of years since you've been doing this that has come to my attention the gut health you know there's been other things that has really opened the door for me to understand when things has, has occurred and I can think, right, how do I, I'm in it now, how do I get out of it and how do I maintain being out of it? So thank you, Christos Sahu. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Oh, you're welcome. welcome. Yeah, man. It's a pleasure. Mm. A pleasure. All right, well, thank you. Well, it looked like we'll be... Um, We'll, we'll leave everybody with those thoughts there, with, do, with those things to contemplate upon, the um the structure of the body, the muscles, the mm -hmm. voluntary and the voluntary muscles, and how we can better utilize them and then make a more efficient, utilize, or create a more efficient body. And with that more efficient body, receiving more um, energy, and with that more energy, and as we're less stressed, the energy goes into other things and it's these other things now that, that we've been talking about, which is interesting to investigate. Yeah, so I hope everyone's enjoyed that. Yeah, no, it was good. No, thank you for everyone participating um, in this talk. Um, yeah. And I must say, for the first time, I've actually ut utilised the time to stretch some of my muscles. <laughs> I've yeah. been <laughs> using the foam roller and my knuckles to rub into my muscles where, where I feel a bit of tightness. So I'm starting to actually engage a bit better by using my time whilst I'm here for, these for this time. I haven't remained static. You see? Because look, you see, you can't even see. But I've been massaging... I've been massaging my back <laughs> with the, with these two things uh, while we've been sitting down talking. Yeah, you see, I've been I've been doing the same thing. Hmm. At least not myself. So you know, I it's should've... never too late to start. Yeah, mm -hmm. and even when you're good, you have to keep on going. You have to keep good. <laughs> you have to keep good. That's how you keep on going. It's true. That's, that's the only way, man. Really? Well, thank you very much. Have a good weekend, everybody. Uh, until the next time. All right, then. Take care now. everyone. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Have a good night, everyone. I'll catch you next month. Thank you very much, Sahu and Christos. Yeah, really, really interesting. Thank you.
And for, for the first time, um, so I'm understanding a bit more at a deeper level all the metaphysicals and what you're talking about. I really grasped some nuggets today. It's like, yeah, it's sinking in. It's like really starting to make sense. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's really good. That's it. That's, it takes time, isn't it? Repetition. It does. Repetition. And then, yeah. you know, you, you, you hear the stuff, you have to regurgitate it. You have to analyze the stuff. After analyzing the stuff, yeah, it's like you have to create your own perception around it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's only through that, those layers of thinking that we're able to really grasp, and that's anything really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful journey. Yeah, yeah man. So We give time for the journey, you. innit? Yeah. Press, press here. Thank you. All right. All right, Sankofa. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful catch you next month, innit? Thank <laughs> right. you. Bye now. All right. <laughs>